So help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. According to one recent survey, one study, at least 40 million Americans have had their DNA investigated by 23andMe or Ancestry.com. 40 million Americans. Have any of you had that done yet, just out of curiosity? Uh, a, couple, a couple people have. And for most people, this exercise is relatively uneventful. You might learn one or two things from uh, the results, but for some people, going through this process, they learn more than they ever wanted to know. Uh, one journalist said that Ancestry.com should change their tagline to Ancestry.com, where you can finally prove that your family is just as weird as you always suspected. <laughs> and I said, that's, that's right, that's a pretty good line. And when you come to the Bible, you realize that the Bible is filled with genealogies, that the Bible traces the ancestors of so many people all throughout the scriptures. And these genealogies are not filled with perfect people. They're not filled with the most godly people on the planet, even though they're in the Bible. Rather, the genealogies in the Bible are filled with messy, sinful, and broken people. And the question I want to explore this morning is the question, what do you do with genealogies? What are you supposed to do with gene genealogies? When you're reading your Bible and you come across a genealogy, what are you supposed to do? And this is a significant question because most of the time when we see genealogies, we skip them. They're like that ad before a YouTube video. Uh, you endure those five seconds and then you skip it and you move on to whatever is next. In fact, I've had many people tell me, tons of people tell me over the years, that the only time they pay attention to genealogies is when they're looking for biblical names. Uh, they're trying to figure out, what are we going to name our kids? And so we got to start paying attention to these genealogies. Uh, and I've learned from personal experience, some genealogies are filled with good, strong biblical names. But the three genealogies listed so far in the book of Genesis do not provide many options for naming your kids unless you want to name your kids Arpak Shad, so here's some names on the list, Arpak Shad, Peleg, Nimrod, Tubal Cain, Joktan, and the list goes on and on from here. And so why is this valuable? If we're not going to find a list of names to name our children, and it's not particularly interesting typically for us, what's the value of it? We know this is not random. We know that every word is inspired uh, by God. We, we know that this is not, it's not just filler in the biblical story. So why is it here? Why is the genealogy here? What are we supposed to learn? Well, I'm going to give you two reasons it's here this morning. There are many more than two, but I'm just going to give you two. The first is that the genealogy in Genesis 11 is a link in a chain connecting Adam to Jesus. Okay, so what's going on in Genesis chapter 11? When we read the genealogy in Genesis chapter 11, what is going on? It is a link in a chain connecting Adam to Jesus. To Jesus, And this is where we need to zoom out of Genesis 11 just for a moment and consider the rest of the biblical story. I want you to just imagine for a moment a big, strong, heavy-duty chain. A big, strong, heavy-duty chain. In fact, as I'm thinking about it right now, I probably should have brought a chain. Now, this is a little bit random, but did anyone bring a chain? Does anyone have a chain? You have a chain? Okay, any other chains? You have a chain? What do you got? Yes, that will work. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. Why don't you come on up and give it up for Nathan Cook. Way to come prepared, Nathan. Way to come prepared. You got to get up here now. You got to help me for a second. Do you just carry this around all yeah. the time? Here, why don't you come? <laughs> okay, stand over there. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, here's a chain, as you can see, big, strong, heavy chain. And I'm Adam. I'm Adam. Uh, there is a real Adam who lived, the first man who ever lived, and he sinned. He rebelled against God, and because he rebelled against God, he brought sin into the world, sin and death into the world. And what you see in the scriptures is that uh, the Bible records the descendants of Adam, and it goes from Adam to Jesus. But you think about all the potential lines from Adam all the way to the rest of the world, I mean, you'd think about all the different families of the world, and you, you, would, you would think that you would wonder to yourself, okay, so what's the purpose of the genealogy? Well, the genealogy, the purpose of the genealogy, each genealogy is like a link in the chain connecting Adam to Jesus, because there's a real Jesus who came into the world. Uh, a real Jesus, the Son of God, who, who did not bring death and sin into the world, rather, he overcame sin and death. He is the Son of God who lived for us, he died for us, and he rose for us. 
And in the wisdom of God, we are given this genealogical chain. And we're supposed to connect all the genealogies in the Bible, from Adam all the way to Jesus. And in what we're looking at in Genesis chapter 11 is one link in the chain, a very important link, connecting Shem, the son of Noah, connecting Shem to Abraham, who is the father of the nation of Israel. He's the first Jewish person, a Gentile who was lost, but God called him to himself. And then from Abraham will come Isaac and Jacob and the nation of Israel and eventually the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is a significant link. So Genesis chapter 11 is a significant link in the chain, and we're not supposed to understand the genealogy by itself. We're supposed to see where it goes and how it connects, connects to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Nathan, thank you for your help. Give it up for Nathan. Good work. Good job. Way to come prepared. Good job. So why is this significant? So it's a chain. It's, part, it's a link in the genealogical chain from Adam to Jesus. Now, why is that significant? Why should you care about it? Why does it matter? Well, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It says, and I, this is the Lord speaking, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So earlier in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve rebel. They sin. And because of that, sin enters the world. Why is the world broken? Is it because we don't know enough? Certainly not. It's because sin is alive and well in us. Sin is alive and well in the world. And it came into the world through Adam. But in verse 15, God makes a promise. And I want you to notice two truths about the promise that God makes in verse 15. First, it's that God plans to destroy the serpent, redeem humanity, and undo the curse of sin. Chapter 3 is depressing. Adam and Eve are in paradise. They have everything that they, they could ever imagine. They have fellowship with God, a, a perfect a perfect environment, all the food they could ever want, but they rebel against God. They fall into sin, and death comes into the world through them, and so it is so depressing, but what you see in verse 15 is that sin will not win. Sin is not the end. Sin is not the victor. God will destroy the serpent. He will redeem humanity, and he will do, undo the curse of sin. Truth number two is that a man will destroy the serpent, redeem humanity, and undo the curse of sin. So God's plan, he plans to destroy the serpent, redeem humanity, undo the curse of sin, but he's going to do it through a man. He's going to do it through a man. Verse 15, he, a descendant of the woman, will crush your head, the head of the serpent. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And so from Genesis 3 on, the Bible anticipates a man who will be born of a woman, who will crush the head of the serpent. But who will that man be? Who will that man be? All we're told in verse 15 is that this man will be born of a woman. That's all we are told. And so if you didn't know the whole biblical story, when you come to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, you would wonder if Cain is that man. So Genesis 4, 1 says, The man was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. I imagine that Eve was wondering, Adam and Eve were wondering, is this child the child that will undo the curse of sin and redeem humanity? Is Cain the one? Is he the deliverer? Keep reading the story. No. Not only will Cain not crush the head of the serpent, he will crush the head of his brother, demonstrating the devastating impact of sin in the world. But we're told that Adam has three named sons, Abel, who is dead. So what that means is that the promised deliverer will not go through Abel because he's dead. He will not have a descendant who will crush the head of the serpent. Cain, what about Cain? Well, Cain becomes a restless, a restless wanderer on earth, and God will not fulfill his promise to redeem the world through Cain. So this leaves Seth, that God gives Adam and Eve another son named Seth. And as you read the story, your eyes key in on Seth, Will Seth be the savior? Will he be the deliverer? What's the answer? No. You keep reading Genesis 5 and 6, you see that sin is spreading like cancer, consuming more and more of the world. But there is a descendant from Seth, a man named Noah. And God calls Noah to himself, raises up Noah, tells Noah to build the ark. God, God helps Noah to build the ark. Noah preaches for 100 years, builds the ark. And he uses that ark to deliver Noah and his family and the animals 
of the world. And you begin to wonder, as you read the story, you begin to wonder, is Noah, is he the one who's going to deliver humanity, redeem humanity? What's the answer? No. You see in Genesis chapter 9 that Noah has a little bit of a drinking problem. So he gets drunk and naked in his tent. And you see that Noah is not able to redeem the world from sin because he himself needs redemption. He, he is enslaved to sin. He needs a savior. But Noah has three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem. So through whom will God fulfill his promise to redeem the world? Through Japheth? No. Through Ham? No. It is through Shem. It is through Shem and his descendants that God will redeem the world. He will fulfill his promise to, to undo the curse of sin on planet Earth. And this is what we're looking at in Genesis chapter 11. We're looking at the genealogy from Shem all the way to Abram. It is an important link in the chain. And once you get to the genealogy of Abram, once you get to Abraham, the genealogies get more and more and more specific throughout history. So it starts very broad that, that the Savior will be a descendant of a woman. A man who descended from a woman. That's every possible, or it's every man, every man who has ever lived. And then God gets more narrow, more focused, more focused, more focused, more focused, more focused. Eventually, it leads to a little peasant girl in Nazareth named Mary. That the genealogy leads all the way to this little peasant girl named Mary in Nazareth. So here's a, here's a little illustration. I did not put this together, but I think it's relatively helpful. That the genealogy starts with Adam, goes to Seth, and then all the way down to Noah, and then Noah to Shem, all the way to Ab Abram or Abraham. And then from Abraham, you go to Isaac and Jacob and Judah, all the way down to King David. And then from David, eventually you get to Mary. And it is Mary by the grace of God, who gives birth to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And so this is not accidental. What's going on here is not accidental. God is charting his plan for salvation through, through people. He is, he is plotting his plan to redeem the world. And he's, he's, not just using, he's not doing it in some abstract way. He's doing it through human beings, through human DNA, from one generation to the next, to the next, to the, to the next. And I'm convinced that the genealogies in the Bible, if you study them, are one of the greatest proofs pointing to the reality of who Jesus Christ is. It, it is almost unimaginable what is happening in these genealogies. I think they are so compelling. Now, why are they compelling? Well, well they are compelling because most unbelievers, most skeptics, if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian, welcome, we love you, we love that you're here, but many skeptics, many unbelievers, they think that Jesus was just a dude who lived 2,000 years ago in Israel, charismatic leader, great teacher, and then he died. That's, that's what most people think. But that's not, the, the Bible does not allow you to think that way about Jesus. When you read the Bible and examine history, you realize that in order for anyone to have a credible claim at being the savior of the world, you would have to have the right pedigree. You would have to have the right ancestors. You would have to have the right genealogy. See, if Jesus was a descendant of Ham or Japheth, no one would have taken Jesus seriously. If Jesus was a descendant of Shem, but not a descendant of Judah, no one would have taken him seriously. And God keeps getting more and more specific because you think about all the, all the different generations of people where eventually God says, okay, Isaac to Jacob, Jacob to Judah, and you think about all the sons and all the thousands and hundreds of thousands of different families that are included in the nation of Israel, and God is tracing one line, one line to his son. So you have to have the right genealogy down to Jesse. If Jesus was not a descendant of Jesse, Jesse had many sons, but it's not traced through all of his sons, it's traced through one son, David. David had many sons. But the promise would not be fulfilled through any of his sons, one son, Solomon. Solomon had many sons, and it just keeps going all the way down to the point where you get to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the odds of a person living like Jesus Christ, speaking like Jesus Christ, and also having the same genealogy, I mean, that is, those odds are so overwhelmingly small that it's hard to imagine that that would be an explanation, that Jesus is just some random guy who lived 2,000 years ago. See, if Jesus did not have the right genealogy, he would have immediately been disregarded. 
This is why Matthew begins his gospel with a genealogy. He begins the gospel of Matthew with a genealogy because that part of the world, the first question they would have asked about Jesus is, who are his descendants? Does he have the right genealogy? And so Matthew says, let's get this, this, let's get this out of the way. Jesus is the son of God and his genealogy proves it. Jesus is the one that God promised. He is, he is the savior who will crush the head of the devil and redeem humanity and undo the curse of sin. And so Genesis 11, why is Genesis 11 here? It is an important genealogical link in the chain proving that God rules over human history, that he is in charge of everyone and everything, that he fulfills every promise that he makes. He is ruling the world. We need a savior and Jesus is the one who came into the world to save us. Everything in the Bible points to him. Every, all the stories in the Old Testament, all the prophecies in the Old Testament, the prophets themselves, every book of, of the Bible is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, including the genealogies. So why is it here? This is why it's here. The second reason is that the genealogy in Genesis 11 sets the stage for Abram. The genealogy in Genesis 11 sets the stage for Abram. Genesis 1 through 11 covers thousands of years, millions of people, and many generations. I mean, we are moving at a breakneck speed throughout human history in Genesis 1 through 11. But when you get to Genesis 12 through 50, it covers four families. So you have, you have almost 40 chapters covering four families, four men and their families, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So the speed slows way down and the scope gets narrowed, focused in on these four men and their families. And Genesis chapter 11, this genealogy, is the transition point. When does the book of Genesis transition? It's in Genesis chapter 11, 11 in this genealogy. It is the setup for the next 40 chapters. So what do we learn about Abram in this transition time? What do we learn about him? A few details for you. First, Abram and his family worshipped many false gods. So what do we need to know about Abram? Abram and his family worshipped many false gods. Some people will think of Abraham, who's the father of the Jewish nation, they would think of him as always worshiping God. That all the surrounding people, they were, they were worshiping idols, but Abram, he was a man of God. He, he saw the glory of God, he loved the glory of God, he was walking with God the whole time. But the Bible does not allow us to think this way about Abram. The picture we get in the scriptures of Abram and his family before God calls Abram to himself is that Abram is steeped in paganism. Abram and his family, they are steeped in idol worship. Joshua 24, verses one and two say, Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem and summoned Israel's elders, leaders, judges, and officers, and they presented themselves before the Lord. So there's this big meeting in the nation of Israel. And this is what Joshua says, verse two. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Naor lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. So who worshiped other gods? Abraham's dad, Abraham's brother, and Abraham himself. That he was an idol worshiper. He was not worshiping God all the days of his life. He was, he was as lost as anyone else in that part of the world in that time period. Now what gods did Abraham and his family worship? Well, in Genesis 11, 28, and 31, we see that Abram and his family lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. Ur of the Chaldeans, which is modern-day Iraq. Here's a, a map. It's maybe not the greatest map ever, but down bottom right, you see Ur, which is basically modern-day Baghdad. This is where he lived. Now, Ur and Haran, these two cities, were famous for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is that they both had ziggurats. So what, what's a ziggurat? Well, here's a picture of a ziggurat. Uh, and these were around during Abraham's time. These were built before Abraham lived. And so these ziggurats are impressive structures. Uh, some people say this is the, the Babylonian response to the pyramids in Egypt. So this is, this is, this is their structure in, in Babylon. This is their structure that was built to their gods. And these ziggurats were constructed to honor and worship the Lord of the moon, the moon god, who ironically was named Sin. Obviously, the devil got lazy naming that false god, that particular false god. You're just Sin. That's what you are, whatever it is. 
But that's his name. His name was Sin. And Sin was thought of as the God of gods, the Lord of lords in Babylon. He was the, the high God. And this is where Abraham lived. He lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. Likely, he worshiped on, on top of this ziggurat. He went there to go worship the Lord of the moon. On top of this, Abraham's dad was named Terah. Terah. This name Terah has a double meaning. It comes from a word, Yera, which means new moon. Which is, that, that was the, the skeletal structure of the false worship of sin. And so to be named to be named Yera or Terah, new moon, was, this was done in honor of this false god. Now the same word also means Ibex, the mountain goat. Now have you guys seen a picture of a Mesopotamian mountain goat recently? I don't know if you have or not, but here's a, here's a, a mountain goat, here's a picture. Uh, they are pretty, incre- pretty impressive creatures and they had giant horns. And so how do you get giant horns, the, the Ibex mountain goat, connected to the moon god. Well, the moon god was always presented with giant horns. These were the biggest horns in this part of the world. And so the name Terra is directly connected to the false worship or the wrong worship of the Lord of the moon. Uh, one scholar said this, to the original audience, naming your son Terra would be the equivalent of naming your son Satan. So the original audience, when they heard that Abram's dad was named Terah, it would be like us hearing that someone's dad is named Satan. Because this was the God of that region of the world that was lifted up as God of gods. And this name was was given to Abram's dad. Then you have Abram's brother named Haran. And Haran was another one of the, the centers for the false worship of sin. And Abram's brother was named Haran after this city. Then you have Abram's wife named Sarai. Sarai. Sarai, which means queen. Now, if you just left it at that, that would be just fine, but there's more to it. That Sarai is the wife of sin. So she's queen of the moon, the wife of sin. So Sarah, Abram's wife, was named in honor of the moon god. Abraham's sister-in-law is named Milcah. Milcah is the daughter of sin, lord of the moon. And we could just keep going. The whole picture of the story that we see is that Abram and his family are trapped in their sin, trapped in paganism, trapped in their idolatry. Abram was just as lost as the rest of the world. And this gives me great hope. It gives me great hope. Because sometimes when I look at people, this is what I think. I think that person or these people, they're too lost. They're, they're beyond the redemption of God. They're just so, they're so hardened, they're so calloused, they're so blind that there's no turning back for them. And my heart can give up on people like that. I begin to think they're just gone. They're just gone. But what we see with Abram is that he was a man steeped in sin, steeped in idolatry. He was not a worshiper of God. The second detail we learn about Abram is that Abram and his family, God moves Abram and his family out of Ur. God moves Abram and his family out of Ur. Genesis 11, verse 31, Terah took his family, or took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, Haran's son, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife, and they set out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and died in Haran. So the question we need to answer is, why does he leave? Why, do, why, does, why does Abram's family move from Ur of the Chaldeans? I mean, that is, that is a big move, to move your family to a different part of the world. Why did you leave, Abram? Why did his family leave? At first glance, it appears that Terah is leading the charge. It says Terah took his son, Abram, his grandson, all these people, and they left. But there's more to the story. Acts chapter 7 gives us more details about what's going on. Acts 7, 2, this is, St- this is Stephen's preaching of the gospel. He includes Abraham in his story. This is what it says. Brothers and fathers, he replied, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham was he, when he was in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. Okay, so what does Stephen say? That the God of glory appeared to Abram before he went to Haran. So why did they move from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran and then eventually to the land of Canaan? Because the God of glory appeared to Abram. 
God appeared to Abram. At some point in his life, while he was still in Ur, steeped in his idol worship, God appears to Abram. The glory of God appears to Abram. And we are not told what this is like. We're not given all the details of what this is like. We are told that he caught a glimpse of the glory of God. And if you want to know how people change, this is how people change. How do people change? How do your kids change? What, what do your kids need? What do your lost family members need? What do your lost coworkers need? The lost world, what do they need? They need a glimpse of the glory and greatness of God. Otherwise, they will not change. They will not change. And in the story, all of the sudden, this unknown God to Abram presses in, that, that God breaks into Abram's life and reveals just a glimpse of himself. And so when you pray, when you pray for your kids, when you pray for your family, when you pray for your lost friends and coworkers, your, the primary prayer, you, I mean, it's fine to say, you know, I pray they stop smoking weed, or I, I pray that they would just, you know, get a job, or whatever, like, it's good, that's fine to pray for those things. What you should pray for is that they would get a glimpse of the glory of God, that they would see God. Because people don't change, at least they don't change permanently until they see the glory of God. And so God appears, he breaks into Abram's life, and what does he say, verse three? And said to him, leave your country and relatives and come to the land that I will show you, verse four. This is, this is pretty incredible. So God says, leave, get out of here. Leave your, your relatives, your family, and go to the land that I will show you, verse four. This is, this is, this is, this is wild. Okay, what happens? Then he left. He obeys. He actually obeys God. He left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. He, he left. He obeyed God. He wasn't like, oh, God, that's, that's kind of an insightful command. I'm going to go back to my life. That's not what happened. He obeyed God. He obeyed God. And he travels to Haran, and then he goes eventually to the land of Canaan. And so we see early on that Abram was a man that when God showed him his glory, he obeyed. He obeyed. Which leads to the third detail as far as the backstory, it's that Abram and Sarai cannot have children. Cannot have children. So they're steeped in idol worship. The glory of God appears to Abram, and we see that Abram and Sarah cannot have children. Verse 30. Sarai was unable to conceive. She did not have a child. This is the first time we are told in the Bible that someone is unable to have children. What you see in the story so far up to this point is that people are multiplying like rabbits. There's just babies everywhere, genealogies. People are all over the place. And then all of a sudden, for the first time in the Bible, we see that someone cannot conceive. They can't have a child. And the rest of the Bible will bear out the implications of this reality. But all of this is a setup for chapter 12 for next week. Now, the question we need, to, we need to close with is the question, what do we do with this information? So this is all background information. What do we, it's interesting. What do we do with it? Well, here's your application for this morning. Understand the nature of the life of faith. You need to understand the nature of the life of faith. Are you a Christian? If you say yes, that means that God has called you into a life of faith. The Christian life is accomplished not by your flesh. It is not accomplished by your own strength. The Christian life from start to finish is a life of faith. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't, ha it doesn't matter how long you've gone to church. The entire Christian life is a life of faith. And so we need to understand the nature of what God is calling us into. Hebrews 11.8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. And he set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out even though he did not know where he was going. Did you catch that phrase? He went out even though he did not know where he was going. Sometimes the life of faith looks like Noah staying in one place, building one ark for 100 years. Sometimes that's what the life of faith looks like. One ark, 100 years, same project. And sometimes the life of faith looks like Abraham, where God calls him out, and it says that he went out even though he did not know where he was going. 
God was calling him into, insert, into uncertainty. And sometimes, this is what we'll do. You probably don't say this out loud, just like I don't say this out loud, but this is what we do. What we will do is we will come up with conditions in our lives about, uh, about the conditions God needs to meet before I will obey him. Okay, so God, um, if you explain all of the details to me, you explain all of the instructions, you explain all the difficulties up front, if you explain how everything's gonna work out for my good up front, if you remove all the barriers, if all the lights are on, and I can completely understand everything up front, then I will trust you and I will obey you. But this is called, this is called trusting God in the light. Trusting God in the light. Charles Spurgeon says, to trust God in the light is nothing. But to trust him in the dark, that is faith. That is faith. And see, we want, we want to be the type of people who trust God and obey God in the light. But more importantly, we want to be the type of people who trust God and obey God in the dark. When we don't see how everything is going to work out. When we know that God is asking us to do something, and in our, in our minds we're thinking, if I do that, I don't see how it's going to work out the way I want to work out, so I'm not going to do it. God, the nature of faith is that God often is calling us into uncertainty. He, he's calling us to trust him, to depend on him, not on our own wisdom, not on our own plan. And in many ways, the Christian life doesn't even begin until you say in your heart, until you settle in your heart, God, I will trust you even into the darkness, even when I don't quite understand it, even when it's difficult, because if you only obey God when it's easy, when everything makes sense to you, when all the difficulties are removed, it's really not faith. You're just trusting in your own strategy. But Abraham, I love this phrase, he went out even though he did not know where he was going. And see, the journey of your life begins when you resolve in your heart to trust God and obey him even when you don't understand. Where you resolve, God, by your grace, I know that you're good. How do we know that God is good? We know that God is good because of the cross. We know that God has planned our salvation from eternity past. We know that he rules and reigns over all things. We know that all things will work together for the good of those who love him. We know that, that the Lord Jesus Christ loves us. How do we know that? Because he died on the cross for our sins. He, he has met our deepest need, our biggest need to be forgiven, and he has done that through his death on the cross on our behalf. We know that he's good, and he's asking us to trust him. And so I want to ask you this, this morning, I just want to ask you, are, are there areas in your life where you know what God is asking you to do, but you're just, you're just filled with excuses. Well, I don't know how it's gonna work out. It's gonna be too challenging. It's gonna be too difficult. It's, don't live like that. Don't live like that. It dishonors the goodness and grace of God. We wanna be the type of people who we say in our hearts, God, we'll, we'll go anywhere. We'll do anything you want, whatever you ask. I was thinking about um, Psalm 32, this week, Psalm 32, 8 and 9, God says, I will instruct you and show you the way to go. With my eye on you, I will give you counsel. Verse 9. Now look, look at this instruction. Don't or do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding. That's good instruction. Don't be like a horse or a mule without understanding. That must be controlled with a bit and bridle or else it will not come near you. He's saying, don't be a stubborn horse, where with a stubborn horse, you have to put a bit and a bridle in its mouth to, to get it under control. And God says, don't be like that. What's the opposite? The opposite is that, the ver is that the, just the lightest touch of God's spirit can move us. Just the lightest touch of God's word can move us. That we don't need God to take a, a prodder and just push us and move us and pinch us. We don't need that. All we need is the lightest, just the lightest touch of God's word to get us to go the way that God wants us to go. And the way you have that heart is you just settle in advance, whatever you want, Lord. Whatever you want. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to say, whatever you want me to stop doing, whatever you want me to start doing, all of my money and all of my time 
and all of my energy and all of my affections, all of my life is yours. And that is when the journey of the Christian life begins, where you trust him with your life. So brothers and sisters, don't settle for less. Don't settle for just going through the motions. Don't settle for just going part way. Trust God. 